Hello and welcome to Sepsis and Cardiovascular Events. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's talk a little bit about sepsis and what happens in sepsis. So you see this diagram here, and it starts out at the top there with number one. We have some source of infection. Now here we're gonna be talking about bacteria. So when you see the source of infection there, we're gonna be talking about bacteria. Sepsis can also be caused by viruses and by fungi as well. In this case here though, we're talking about bacteria. So we have the source of infection. In this case, it looks like it's the lung and probably a pneumonia. That leads to the bacteria entering the blood. Once the infection enters the bloodstream, then it's going to cause some effects upon the rest of the body, including leaking, of the blood vessels, so we have capillary permeability occurring. We also have some other things that are going to occur as well, and those are all gonna cause organ dysfunction. We're gonna see that here in just a moment as to how all that process works. So we have bacteria in the blood, and it causes three things to occur. These mechanisms are normally used to help to get rid of an infection or help to wall off an area. So say, for example, you get a cut on your hand. Well, we hope that's going to heal up, and there's some parts of the inflammatory process that the body puts into place in order to try to heal up that cut on your hand so that it doesn't become infected or it just doesn't stay open and you bleed to death or something like that. So one of those situations is vasodilation. Vasodilation is designed to help to bring more blood and oxygen to the area of the injury. In the case of when we have sepsis and we have this bacteria floating through the blood causing vasodilation everywhere, it's going to cause venous pooling, hypotension, and shock. So those aren't necessarily the kinds of conditions that we want to see happen. Secondly, we get capillary permeability. Well, it doesn't really help to have all these capillaries expanded and to have all this blood flow in the area if we're not allowing the things that need to get out, like the oxygen and the white blood cells and other things to get out of the bloodstream and into the tissues. So we get capillary permeability and that allows those white blood cells to get out there, attack the bacteria, etc. Now, remember again, though, that the bacteria is in the blood. So this capillary permeability is not just going to happen in my hand. It's going to happen throughout my entire body. This causes edema, hypotension, and shock. The third component that happens with the inflammatory process is clotting. And clotting then is going to cause decreased perfusion by clotting off some of those small vessels. All right, now we've talked about how this may happen in the hand and how this is happening throughout the bloodstream and throughout the whole body. But let's take that a step further and let's say, all right, let's look at the heart. So what happens when this stuff happens to the heart? We're going to get blood pooling, we're going to get edema, and we're going to get clotting in the vessels of the heart. So let's take that one little coronary vessel there, and let's see what's going to happen as a result of all of these conditions. So first of all, we get that vasodilation, so the vessel got bigger, we got more blood flow there now, and now we're starting to get that capillary permeability where the fluid is leaking out of those vessels, and then the cells down here are drowning because they're getting all this capillary permeability, and then we're also, remember, we're also getting that clotting. So the clot happens down there, we get all this vasodilation, we have fluid leaking out, and we're not getting perfusion, and that leads to that poor little cell there not getting enough oxygen. Now, if that little cell happens to be in the heart, this vasodilation, capillary permeability, and clotting will lead to myocardial infarction, heart failure, and it could even lead from that inflammatory process to myocarditis and pericarditis. In a study that was done by Kazakowski and his buddies, they found that the risk of MI was doubled, almost 1.8 times, when the patient had sepsis versus not having sepsis. The risk of heart failure was 1.7 times as great when the patient had sepsis versus the patient not having sepsis. So clearly sepsis is causing some dysfunction of the heart in these patients. 
If you want to take a look at the reference, here it is, the association between sepsis survivorship and long-term cardiovascular outcomes in adults, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Thanks for joining me for sepsis and cardiovascular events. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, 